The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Well, welcome to the podcast, everybody. I am here in studio with Lee Brainerd. Welcome, Lee. Mondo, it's good to be here again. I always love being with the Prophecy Watchers crew. Yeah, we have a we have a lot to talk about today because, um, and I just want to say right up front that the the idea of the pre trib rapture. Uh, as you know, you've spoke a lot on it. Is it can it it brings out uh, sometimes the best and the worst in people, and uh, it, there's a lot of people that um, in general that speak very aggressively at times against the pre-trib rapture. I mean, has that been your experience? It has definitely been my experience. I've had a few of the well-known names in the pre-wrath rapture camp and well-known names in the post-trib rapture camp going after me in in public forums like Twitter. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the so what I want to do today is I want to talk about uh, some of that. I mean, my heart is to keep things positive. Uh, those that disagree with us, I mean, I've been on record over and we love them. They're our brothers in Christ. Um, I don't want to, uh, I want to speak lovingly of them and, and, and speak in a way that's civil. But also what I w would like to do is to uh, interact with some of the things that are uh, some of the criticisms that are happening against the preacher position. I think all of us uh, we never want to uh, disengage in in these. Uh, my, my, I give people the benefit of the doubt. I was a pastor a long time. I give people the benefit of the doubt. Uh, just it's it's easier if I just assume that their motives are pure, <laughs> and that's that's the way I like to live my life. It makes me feel better. But nevertheless, as it relates to the substance of the arguments, uh, regardless of maybe how they're said, uh, I think it would be helpful to begin to address some of those. But let's let's give a little bit of background. So a couple of years ago, you spoke at the pre-trib conference in Dallas, uh, Tommy Ice, uh, Dr. Andy Woods, others. And at the time, you had sent us an article yeah. on the 10 sayings that were found. you found in Ephraim. Let's give a little bit of background of what that is, of what that was, and how you came to speak at the pre-trib conference. Well, originally there had been one Ephraim, the Syrian rapture passage, that had been known in uh, times past. Um, and it was familiar to the pre-trib rapture. Because it was in English. That's yeah. important. <clears throat> yep, mm -hmm. and, and it had been translated out of the out of the Latin into English, and um, it was well known to people. So when I discovered uh, Ephraim, the Syrian rapture passage, while I was doing research on the Greek word apostasia for my uh, book on 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, I came across a rapture passage in Ephraim, the Syrian, that was unknown. At least I couldn't, I didn't recollect it. I, I, mm -hmm. I hadn't seen it. Any so you, and you're in the original Greek here, right? Yeah, okay. we're, we're, yeah where it's untranslated works in, okay, that's in important. Greek. There's over 150 uh, works in Ephraim that either don't have a published English translation or there's a translation that's buried away that someone did for a dissertation or something okay. that's hard to reach. There's maybe only a dozen of his works that have English translations. Okay. Yep. But at any rate, I was going through this research, doing, uh, looking for apostasia, and I found a rapture passage I didn't recognize. So I pulled a few books off my shelf. I did some research on published lists of known patristic rapture passages, and I didn't find it. So I spent about two months going through his works, finding rapture passages. I found over 30 rapture passages that were clear rapture passages, and 10 of them in the context made it clear it was a pre-trib rapture passage. Mm -hmm. So I forwarded that stuff to the uh, to uh, Prophecy Watchers and, and uh, um, it was forwarded to you, and, and we just took off from there. Yeah. So, I mean, this is important because <clears throat> let's set the stage here uh, a little bit, is that uh, oftentimes people who are critical of the dispensational perspective or the preacher position will make a claim or an assertion that the preacher position originated with uh, Jonathan Darby, right? That's it, right. It is, is, as well as Margaret MacDonald, 1830s. Uh, so... We recognize and we go, oh, okay, well, that's a that's fair, right? That's a fair, that's at, at first glance. Yep. Isn't that, that's a fair assertion. Hey, this was started there. Well, okay. So that being the case, because of that uh, assertion, what's our response? Well, we should, we should uh, let their response or their uh, claim stand and say, well, let's challenge it. Let's challenge it. And so we would go to the... For instance, there's a whole string of people from the beginning of the Protestant Reformation up till J.N. Darby's time 
who didn't hold modern dispensationalism per se, but they held to a pre-tribulation rapture in one form or another. Mm -hmm. It was It's not unknown. It's not unheard of. So before you go on there, I mean, William Watson's book, Dispensationalism yes. Before Darby, that's a great book. So he he was a... Um, what was his? He was he was a. Prof I know he's a professor at Colorado Christian University. Do you remember what his what his discipline was? No, I sure don't. Um, I thought it was in the field of history, but that, that, that's what I think too. He was he was it wasn't theology, but he was history, and so he decided, hey, I, I, I can, I know a lot of these these Puritans that were living in England and others, and so he wrote this book, Dispensation Before Darby, uh, covering from the time of the Reformation, primarily in England. Where he addressed, hey, this idea that a dispensational framework began with Darby in the 1830s is completely false. And so he wrote a whole book on it, which again, it helped to challenge this idea, which for him, he's like, well, let's, let's put it to scrutiny. So we have that now, really, I would say post reformation thinking d documented in the book, which helped to challenge that assertion. Yes. So I think the, uh, one of the claims often that is made is that we, uh, or you or others, the researchers, that because we have no evidence for the preacher position at all in the Bible, we're trying to go scour the church fathers to find something that and, and respond to that, because that's that's really not true. I, uh, to me, uh, I mean, it seems it's almost hysterical to me, really, because I believe in the pre-tribulation rapture because of clear teaching in the Bible. The interplay that we see in Revelation chapter 4 through 5, mm -hmm. the promise in Revelation 3.10 to be kept from the hour of trial, the promise in John 14, 1 through 3, that the next time the Lord Jesus interacts physically with the church, they're going to glory. They're going to go to the new Jerusalem. They're going to go to the Father's house. They're not going to stay down here on earth. Mm -hmm. And we could multiply these references. So my, my conviction is based on the scriptures. And the only reason I go to the church fathers isn't because I need ammunition to prove the pre-tribulation mm -hmm. rapture. It's because I need ammunition to overthrow the objection yes. that the pre-trib rapture is not seen in the early fathers, and that is the farthest from the truth you could be. Yep. So, let, let, I mean, because uh, a lot of the work, I, I got to speak at the pre-trib conference as well on the Olivet Discourse and Luke 17 and, and Matthew 24, well, all, all the Olivet Discourse, in the sense of looking at a rescue Yes. Before the day of the Lord. And uh, and it was a rescue prior. It was a pre-day of the Lord rescue. So uh, it's in the Bible. It's there. But again, let, let me clarify for those listening that because uh, th this has come up recently. Uh, Joel Richardson makes a comment. I was I actually saw the Twitter thing uh, myself and I commented there. And again, we love Joel. He's a brother in Christ. Uh, but one of the things that he mentioned on there was that phrase that, well, the reason that people are, are trying to find the church fathers is because it's not in the Bible. And I'm like, whoa, that's, I said, that's not the whole story, man. Um, and I said it very nicely because like, we should be nice. But so just so people understand is we're not looking at pre-Darby things for to defend the view. But when people make an accusation that it started with Darby, uh, you and I have talked about this a lot, that it, it's it's a myth. It, it's a myth that kind of refuses to die. It continues to continue to, to be shared on the internet, social media. So our goal is simply to go and say, just like William Watson did, hey guys, um, that's fair. It's a fair statement up front. Let's challenge it. And it's false. And so here you are uh, doing research. You found the 10 references in Greek Ephraim, which yep. is, hasn't been out there, uh, which I think is is valuable research. That's why Tommy Ice, uh, at the time, Dr. Tommy Ice, when I remember to going to dinner with him and I said, did you read uh, Lee's paper? And he said, uh, you know, Mondo, I get a lot of these things. And at first glance, I was like, Oh, cut. No way. I don't believe a second of it. But he said that he's written, uh, he wrote a scholarly article uh, where he had 35 references to pre Darby church father, you know, kind of things it, outside of William Watson's work. And he said, but once I got into Lee's work, he said, it's 10 more at least that I can add to my 35. Yeah. He goes, but I realized that the work being done by Lee in these untranslated works, they're just, they're, I mean, again, thousands and thousands of pages. He said, I was so uh, compelled that I gave up my spot, yeah. my own spot speaking at the pre-chip conference to fast track him in to let people know not only of the work that you're doing, but also the the the, the magnitude of what you found there. Yeah. And the work has continued. We've discovered another nine uh, pre-trib passages in Eusebius. 
As far as I know, no one knew that Eusebius was pre-trib because his few works translated into English don't make it clear. Mm -hmm. So, so who do we have? Let, let's talk about um, th this. This assertion is that nope, this was never in 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 the church fathers. So let's step back for a moment because we believe it's in the scripture. Yep. Uh, we believe again all the you know Luke seventeen, John fourteen. You referenced all of them, but um, let's also. Let's also set the stage a little bit for the history of the church fathers. We recognize that we now we're we're walking on the shoulders of two thousand years of of church history and doctrine and formulation and other things and the an, the analysis of scripture. I don't expect a first or second century theologian uh, to have full developed theologies like we do, systematic theologies like we. I mean, you get books, they're volumes, right? Volumes you can get of systematic theology. They didn't have that. They were they, they were new. They didn't have the other giants. They only had a hundred years of, of maybe some people studying it. Well, that's exactly right. For instance, we're looking at Irenaeus here today, and we're we're working our way there. But in Irenaeus's day, which is in the second century, early, they, very they early, had yep. not yet worked through the entire tr Trinitarian controversy. They hadn't worked through a lot of the controversies on very fundamental doctrines of the faith. So. Uh, they hadn't worked through the whole eschatology dispute yet either. Yeah, so, you know, that's, I'm glad you bring up the Trinity because there's a lot of people that are critical of that. But the fact of the matter, it wasn't that the, the fourth century church, you know, at the Council of Nicaea just decided to create the Trinity. But what they're doing is they're looking at the Bible where it, you know, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, you're like, well, that's name is singular, but the Father, Son is plural. And then in, you know, John 1, 1, you have all these passages that the early church is trying to come out of this Jewish framework of monotheism, which is very strict. And all of a sudden they're going back and going, Oh, look at that. There are, there are hints of this, of this triune God in the Old Testament. Uh, you know, Proverbs 30 about, Who's the son? Do you know his name? You know, Isaiah 9, 6, the mighty God. So you have all these passages, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. So you have all these things that they're wrestling with. And I, I, I actually give them, I give them credit because it, plus apart from just simply trying to live, <laughs> you know, in, in a, in a very, I would say primitive, but a much more difficult society, they're wrestling with these theological challenges. How do we, how do we believe in one God, but yet we see this text reveal the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit? Yeah, and I, I agree. And when you come to the prophecy issues here, you run into the, the whole controversy. If you don't have settled theological terminology, you don't have a settled eschatological systematic theology, and then you come to the issue of a distinction between Israel and the church, yeah. and that you're going to have the church facing one set of circumstances in the last days, and then God's going to return to Israel, and they're going to face another set of circumstances. And how are you going to clarify that? How are you going to qualify it? How are you going to describe it? Yep. So let's bring up another passage, which I think is fascinating, is... Uh, the, the the seventy weeks of Daniel, Daniel nine. But he's giving them, he's given the the, the angels explaining it to, to Daniel. But then in Daniel twelve, he says, "This is you know six hundred BC. Seal it up, Daniel, because it, it at the time of the end, it'll knowledge will be increased." Amen. So we have this recognition that the first century, second century, um, the, some of their eschatology was you know it was varied. And so we expect that as we get closer to the end and Israel comes back as a nation, which happened in 48, that now all of a sudden we begin to understand more. But there were those, there were those as, as I gave a presentation in another place on just some of the commentaries before, uh, like 1800s, um, they, they recognize Israel's coming back as a nation. That's a straight value. That's a straightforward reading of scripture. But what you, we do see now is in the last couple of hundred years, as we see Israel become a nation, we go, now we can see more how the framework is works for this end of the age scenario. That's exactly right. Because you can't really have uh, some of the prophecies about Israel in the last days. There's really nothing underneath if Israel isn't there as a physical nation. Yep. They start with the assumption that Israel is in the land as a nation. Yep. So let's go to, you know, 120 uh, eight, or, you know, 150 AD, Irenaeus or whatever. So to 200, where he was around 200. What, what, isn't that, he's about 150 yep. to 200? The mid second century yep. up to the end so of the third. The Barcock revolt has already been completed in 135. Yep. 
the Israel the Israelites now they're completely eliminated from the land under threat of death. So for a theologian, they're looking over at Israel and they're going, man, Israel's gone, gone, D dustbin of history, exiled to all the nations, as Jesus said in Luke 21. So for them, I can imagine, and we see this with Augustine later in 400 AD, he's recognizing, oh, this is replacement theology. Yep. Israel is now all the promises in the Old Testament that were unfulfilled, which they recognized they were unfulfilled. Well, those are going to be fulfilled somewhere, sometime in the church, in this new work of God doing in, in the church age. So we can see why, in some ways, based on their, um, I would call it current event hermeneutics, yep. that they recognize, oh, Israel's gone. So for God to be true and faithful, those prophecies must be fulfilled, and the only way they can be fulfilled is in the church, versus them saying, hey, in some future time, God's going to bring Israel back. Yeah, that's that right. was inconceivable to them. Yeah. And what's interesting is it wasn't inconceivable in um, Irenaeus' time because he writes very clearly, uh, for instance, in Heresies, chapter 534.1, which is on page three here. Mm -hmm. we, he says, I, I, I make the observation here that Irenaeus regards God as having two redemption programs. And he says, he who in the New Testament raises up from the stones children unto Abraham— is he who will gather according to the Old Testament those that shall be saved from all the nations. Jeremiah says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that they shall no more say the Lord lives, who led the children of Israel from the north and from every region whither they had been driven. He will restore them to their own land, which he gave to their fathers. So he makes a clear distinction between uh, the, the New Testament uh, program and the Old Testament saints being gathered again. And if you, if you think about it, the New Testament program is obviously dom, den, dominated by the Gentiles, but in those Old Testament promises of gathering Israel, they're gathering the physical seed yes. of Jacob. Yeah, what I see here, um, this is a great, um, I'm seeing some of this for the first time, Lee, because uh, here you have something being written, again, in, in the mid-second century. I'm going to include this in my presentation. <laughs> I didn't have this before. Because this idea of the spiritual seed, we know that Galatians 3, the yep. spiritual seed of Abraham, we know that we're part of that. Yep. We're, you know, He's the father of the faithful. But you still have the physical seed or the ethnic seed of Abraham, uh, which is Israel specifically, uh, as we know the rest of the passages of Scripture about them being restored. So for him to say he'll restore them to their own land, that's absolutely incredible that he understood that distinction that's exactly right. And so this is really part of the case that we can use to demonstrate that Irenaeus really did hold to a pre-tribulation rapture. He made a distinction between the, the church saints of this age and the Israel that's after the church is out of the picture, as well as having some pre-trib rapture passages that we'll look at in a moment. So let, 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 let me do another thing here for the, for the listeners, because... When we think about dispensationalism, it, 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 it's a dirty word in, in many camps. But I want people to understand that dispensationalism, uh, at least as it relates to the key pillars, you have a literal hermeneutic. Yep. You take Scripture straightforward. If the prophecies of Jesus' first coming were literal, the prophecies of his second coming are literal. I mean, that's, to me, that's very expected. The second distinction is is, or the second pillar is that the church and Israel are distinct. Absolutely. And the third pillar is that God does everything for his glory. So that's it. There's three. So you can have dispensationalism is at the core, those three things. Now, from there, you can have a Calvinist dispensationalist. You can have Arminian dispensationalist. You can have a, a uh, charismatic dispensationalist. You can have somebody that is baptizing babies as a dispensationalist. I mean, so we don't want to look at those like a charismatic as an example of theology as defining dispensationals it isn't that's right but so oftentimes people will throw oh it, dispensations they're all calvinists well i don't want to be one of those or they're all arminian well i don't want to be one of those that has nothing really to do with dispensational thinking it has to do with that lim literal hermeneutic again a distinction between church and israel and and he does all things for the glory of god so with that as a as a backdrop when you see what Irenaeus is saying here this is very dispensational absolutely in the sense he's taking things literal, that would be the only way he would get there, and he's making a distinction between the spiritual seed and the physical seed. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, we've got another passage here. Let's see, it's um, on the last page here, page four, and 
I bring out, well, actually, it starts on the page th uh, three. Number four there on the bottom? Yep. So we are going to be looking at um, where Irenaeus sees Israel in the tribulation. And so he's up the passages in Heresies 5, uh, section 25.4. And we read here, a king of a most fierce countenance shall arise, one understanding dark questions and exceedingly powerful, full of wonders, and he shall corrupt, direct, and influence and put strong men down. And then, and I put it in italics here, uh, the holy people likewise. So he's got a vendetta here against the holy people. But he's going to qualify who he means by the holy people. And then he points out that the time that his tyranny shall last, during which the saints shall be put to flight, they who offer a pure sacrifice unto God. And then he clarifies again, in the midst of the week, the sacrifice and the libation shall be taken away, and the abomination of desolation shall be brought into the temple, even unto the consummation of the time shall the desolation be complete. Now three years and six months constitute the half week. So... This is Daniel 9. Yes. I mean, it's so, amazing. So basically what he's saying is he's he's taking the 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 return to the temple and the return of the sacrifices literally and he d qualifies which saints he's talking about, those that are offering a pure sacrifice unto God. This is talking about the physical nation of Israel mm -hmm. returned unto God. So let me ask uh, do you uh the word pure there? Yeah. Um the, is there any other nuance to that in the sense of uh because I imagine Irenaeus probably would have a difficulty of thinking that the sacrifice from a new covenant perspective would be pure. Did, is there any other who offer a pure sacrifice? You know, what I'm, you, you see where I'm going in that? Yeah, well, what I would uh, gather is he was so close to the apostolic age. I mean, Irenaeus was a, a disciple of Polycarp, mm -hmm. who had been a disciple of John himself. Mm -hmm. So the very... Uh, uh, apostle who had written the book of Revelation, who put the capstone on the prophetic revelation for all of the scriptures, had personally communicated a, a, the, the the core dispensational understanding to Polycarp. Polycarp had delivered that mm -hmm. to Irenaeus. I suspect that Irenaeus really did understand, maybe in a, in a simpler form than mm -hmm. we do, yep. but God was, was going to go back to Israel, um, that they have seven more years under the law, mm -hmm. and that God is going to bring the new covenant salvation to them. And I think that's where yeah. he's going. I mean, and, and him to say that the sacrifice and libation shall be taken away. I mean, this is Daniel 9, 27. I Absolutely. mean, this, this is this is clear that he's referencing that passage and that he gets it so right so early is, is very impressive. Well, uh, let's do a couple things here because I think this is helpful. <clears throat> so, you, you, we talked about your first presentation uh, at the pre-trib, and then um, you, you gave another presentation, skeletal thing of Irenaeus. But what's been happening um, recently? Again, some some big time guys are are coming in there, and they're being critical, which is again, it's fine. I don't mind criticism. Uh, hopefully, everybody's nice about it. But let's talk about some of the 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 methodology of some of these criticisms um, that. That you you have here. Let's talk about number one down there, uh, or or number two. So on the bottom of page one. Yep. Let's talk about what. Let's let's look. Well, you and I are going to do another uh, pr uh, presentation on the alleged problems with the pre-trib. We want to address those. We like yep. uh, we like obje objections. But let's talk about some of the ways in which people are criticizing here. Yeah. Well, basically, what I see is whenever error is attacking truth, they use the unholy. Trinity. Okay. And uh, that involves, there's always a mantra, there's always a selective use of evidence or a proof text theology, okay. and then there's um, argument ad against hominem. the man, ad harmony. Ad, yeah. you, this is the unholy trinity of false doctrine. And, and to me, like when the Bible says you can know false teachers, we, we really have two tests to understand false teachers, not one, because we already know there's a test of, okay, who's got the best exegetical arguments from the Scripture? But the second test is uh, those that learn their doctrine from the father of lies learn how to defend that doctrine from the accuser of the brethren. 
and and there's a little bit doesn't mean they're not real believers but there's an element of harshness yeah. in their dealings and an element of unfairness and so they they always fall back on a mantra that's defended with proof texts and then they argue against the person rather than present so, exegesis so yeah cuz i mean again we don't i'm glad you mentioned that with that we're not saying that anybody that disagrees with us are unbelievers but by any means but the fact of the matter is and and we we've said this you and i've talked about this where um, we all believe Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. Yep, absolutely. And uh, and some of these other issues, that, that, as important as they are, uh, you don't have to believe in the preacher of rapture to be saved, do you? Absolutely not. Yeah. So we we call these non salvific issues important issues, and so when 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 we come to these, we we go, hey guys, um, make sure that you're being fair. Because I, I want to be that way. I want to be. I don't want to attack the person. That's not a fair argument. I don't yeah. want to to bring his character into play. Um, he could be the worst guy in the world. Uh, maybe he's out sleeping around or he's doing drugs, but he's got good theology. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. the fact of the matter is, I want to interact with his argument. And now his person. That's between him and the Lord. They're going to work that out. But yeah. um, if if he if he makes a a theological comment, I'm going to engage the argument itself. That's exactly right. And so right. I'm not, you know, so when what, what I do see oftentimes is those comments that people make that they you know uh, they'll start attacking the the person. Oh, you're yeah. a preacher, yeah, we know how you are, and you're like, really? Oh, come on, can't you be nice? Um, I just had a guy recently. He's, he was trying trying to engage me um, in into some eschatology uh, comments, and I said. Sure, I like talking theology, but about three emails in, because I didn't agree, all I'm going to hell. Um, it, he, it was just, it was very. I was like, wow, just because I don't agree with exactly what you think that the Great White Throne Judgment's going to be, that now I'm on my way to hell. I said, I thought my salvation was based on my my, my faith in Jesus. Amen. But, so I was just like, hey man, uh, you know what? I, I'm 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 done. It's not that I don't like to discuss these things, but if, if you're going to get all angry and start uh, putting hellfire on everybody, I go. I'm not I'm not interested. I said, you know the the goal is this is First Corinthians thirteen two. Yep. If I know all mysteries, if I have perfect theology, yep. But I don't have love. That's right. I'm nothing. And when we come to a, the theological debate, and you really nailed it, we 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 can leave the character out of the question because the only thing that matters is is who's presented the truth of the scriptures most yep. accurately. Yep. And, and I've discovered that when you're in a, the, a conversation, whether it's formal debate, whether it's just a living room conversation over a cup of coffee, if one party gets frustrated and they can't answer point by point with what the Bible says, and they start to lose their traction, they mm -hmm. will jump into the argument against the man, argument ad hominem. Yeah. And th these are, uh, you know, I, I studied logic, and and which is good and bad because my poor daughters growing up, <laughs> it was always specificity was like the favorite word in the family, and uh, <laughs> specificity, girls, specificity, and so, but they learned in the sense of uh, to think carefully and, yep. and with precision, and so you you think about. The, again, the fallacy of the ad hominem argument. Well, yeah. if I'm not getting this way, I'm just going to attack the person's character. Well, that's not doing it. But also, one of the other things that you see is, uh, you have written here, uh, there are claims that no scholar has ever believed that Irenaeus was pre-trib. Well, yeah. that's the fallacy of, of rooting to authority. Yeah. So what does that have to do with anything? Because no scholar uh, uh, agrees with this. Now, there's a certain level of humility yeah. that, okay, well, I don't want to be some uh, loner in my theology, but we know that after the New Testament was written and finished, theologians came up with new discoveries or new ideas all the time. So somebody had to discover it yep. as being new. And so the real question is not whether I can quote a scholar. Sometimes it's helpful because maybe they've done additional work. The question is, is it true? Is it biblical? Does it match good exegetical methodology? Yeah, and I and I agree. For instance, when you bring up this question, and they'll say, okay, no scholar that I'm aware of has ever held that Irenaeus was pre-trib. Well, what's funny to me is, okay, I just do a little quick Google search on my front page, on the top 10 results, I get several well-known names that were mentioned Irenaeus is pre-trib. Okay. Well, but what's also interesting is I would say, well, okay, well, it doesn't really matter. Because it doesn't matter. Uh -oh. well, I don't personally know a single theologian that's read 
the entirety of Irenaeus' heresies from the first chapter to the end, beginning of the first chapter, all the way to or the first book, all the way to the end of the fifth book, mm. read it in English, and then worked through the Latin and the Greek of the passages that were difficult to understand to make sure that they had the uh, they were actually being uh, faithful to what the intent of the author was, mm-hmm. and so. So if, if you don't have people that have actually worked all the way through Irenaeus's ecclesiology and eschatology and worked through the whole work and came up with conclusions on the eschatology and came up with conclusions on the ecclesiology and these things harmonize and balance with each other, if you don't have that, then really all you're talking about is uh, you're just throwing names out there, but um, they're, they're scholars in their own right but they're not necessarily a scholar in Irenaeus. See, and, and, and well, even let's, let's put another angle on it. You have people that maybe uh, are a scholar in Irenaeus, but they're not a scholar in systematic theology. Exactly. And so now it, it takes a very um, balanced approach to come to the place of going, okay, um, th- that, that's why, you know, when I was in college and seminary, I tried to be very broad. Right. Because, and as a pastor, you just, you can't help it, but try to be broad because you're pastoring. So there's all kinds of uh, breadth to what people ask you. So you kind of have to be a general practitioner of things. But, but in reality, I, I look, I think about the work that you're doing. So you, let's say you take a, an irony, a scholar who's reading the Latin, the Greek, but he doesn't understand what we just mentioned earlier, the distinctions of dispensational thinking. That's right. He can, maybe comes from a covenantal perspective or whatever. So as he's reading it, he's going to see something totally different by not, he's, he's not going to see that, that distinction that we saw earlier between the spiritual seed, which is a new covenant idea and the physical seed. And that's very dispensational. So if he doesn't have that, if he lumps them all into one group, then he's not going to see, those things aren't going to jump out at him. That's exactly right. And he's going to miss them. They're going to have the same struggles reading Irenaeus that they have reading the Old Testament and the New Testament. Yep. So let, let's let's talk about that for a minute because uh, one of the things that uh, that I, like for example, I, I have a, I have a Ref- Reform Study Bible. I got this big fat Bible. Some people see it on television. I'm like, what Bible is that? I go, well, it's a Reform Study Bible edited by R.C. Sproul. And it's, and it's not that I agree with R.C. Sproul on his eschatology, but the reason I got it is because I wanted to make sure that I was reading him accurately. Right, right. So when I open up Matthew 24 and I have his book that he wrote, The Last Days According to Jesus, I'm like, okay, I don't want to misrepresent this guy. He's my brother. I love him. I'm going to see him in heaven. He's there now. But... I don't want to be one of those guys that <laughs> that misrepresents the other perspective. And uh, we don't have all the answers. But on that note, you have this confusion sometimes with the word church. That's right. So talk about that and talk about maybe the, the, the history. Again, we understand from a dispensational perspective. Right. Church is very distinct. But let's talk about how the word church sometimes is, is misconstrued or confused. Yeah, well, for instance, in modern uh, dispensationalism, when we use the word church, we, we are referring not to all the saints of all the ages. We are referring only to the saints that basically from the time of Christ forwards to the— to Basically Pentecost forward. Yeah, to mm-hmm. the, the mm-hmm. saints of this age. Mm-hmm. And we think the Old Testament saints and the tribulation saints, we would put them in, in under the heading of Israel and maybe Gentile proselytes to Israel. It's a very di- different idea. Now, if you're in the reform camp, they use the word church. That collects everyone from Adam all the way to the end of the age. That's a very it's a anybody term. that's ever been a believer. Yeah, is considered the church. That's right for them, and and that that creates a lot of confusion, especially when we're trying to have conversations. You said about the church. We're like, no, no, no. We're talking from Pentecost on, and not even. So this is the other thing too: is the word the the word saints. Because you see that in Daniel, right? The right. saints will be uh, overcome by the Antichrist. And they're like, oh, see, that's the church because we're saints. Paul says we're saints, right? All over to the saints at yeah. Philippi. Uh, you also see the word elect. That's right. So people need to understand that the word elect, the word believer, the word saint, we would all agree from a dispensational perspective. That's exactly right. That those right. are the broadest terms that you can have. And they, they mean believers of all time. But when we talk about church, Jesus said in Matthew 16, I will build my church. It's a future thing um, that that began at Pentecost. And the saints, the believers during the tribulation, they're not part of the church. That's exactly right. Yeah. See, so this is when you go to Matthew 24 and Jesus sends the angels to go cl- to gather the elect, they say, see, Matthew 24, 29, after the tribulation, he sends his angels. That's the church. You go, no, no, no. 
The elect is a broad word. It means believer of any age. So that doesn't, it's not a, uh, it's not a uh, slam dunk against a preacher position. Exactly. And see, one of the difficulties we face is Irenaeus in uh, book five and chapter 26, section one, has uh, a passage that's the well-known post-trib okay. passage for Irenaeus. And it has the church is being put to flight. So it, he has the church in the tribulation. Let's, well, let's, let's read it. Let's do it. Let's pull that out. Well, I, mean, I actually don't have that oh, on oh, my printout. It was just from our conversation. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It, so, the church is put to flight. So what does that mean then? Let's, let's, what's going on there? So what we have to understand is, and I, I'm going to bring this out in an article I'm going to put up on my website, but Irenaeus has several passages oh, in which he defines what he means by the church. So we believe the church is just the saints of this age in the contrast from all the other ages. Irenaeus is a little broader. He has the church as a technical term for all the seed of Abraham, the spiritual seed, and the physical seed. Oh, and he okay. makes a clear distinction between uh, God's working with the, the uh, Gentiles of this age and going to be returning to Israel. So as soon as you go down that route, the fact that he has the church in the tribulation, you have to decide, okay, is he talking about the spiritual seed of Abraham or the physical seed of Abraham? Yeah. Now, if you're going to get uh, bent out of shape over the use of a particular word over terminology, you're going to make a debate here. He says church, he must mean what we mean by church. Mm -hmm. But the fact of the matter is, you have to go to his context. You have to go to his... Um, his other writings. His other writings mm -hmm. to qualify or clarify yeah. what he means by the word church. See, this is some of the other thing that we were talking about uh, in the sense of approaches. All of us can do this. I know I've been guilty of this. Um, guilty of proof texting. Yep. I mean, we, we, it's just natural, you know, give me a verse for that. Give me a verse. That's kind of the way that, that we should live. But we also could say, give me a verse. And then we selectively present a verse and that we minimize the other verses that might shed increased light on how we're taking that wrong. Um, you see this a lot in the Trinitarian debate. Uh, you just pull a verse out. There's one God. And then you go, okay. Well, what do we do with that? There's one God. That's it. That's it. There's no Trinity. And so, or Jesus says, my father is greater than I. There it is. Proof text done. Jehovah's Witnesses will do this. Yep. And you go, well, um, what's the context? How was that written? And is there other passages? What does it mean over at sea? If all we had was that verse, my father is greater than I, uh, we would we would miss that he's talking in his servant role in his humanity. That's right. Versus his deity, which he... He didn't set aside his deity. He set aside the prerogatives of his deity in Philippians right. 2. So, but here we have a proof texting problem, and we don't want to be guilty of that. But in this instance, if we take the one verse, the church is put to flight yep. without taking into consideration the other things that Irenaeus wrote about the fullness of what he means, yep. we would miss that. And that would be, the, honestly, that would be a very powerful verse for a, a post trib or whatever. But with now that we see the rest of the context, you're like, no, it, it, it blunts it. Though. That's right. And so we already looked at passages where we see that he has a clarification or a distinction between Israel and the church. But he's actually got three pretty, I think they're clear, pre-trib rapture passages. And the first one is on page two here. Yeah, let's jump into some of these because this, is, this okay. is great. Here's the first one. It's in, again, all the stuff is from heresies. And this is heresies, book five, chapter five, section one. So before you get in there yep. for a second... Um, if people want to look at this, are these things that you're looking at in English or in Greek? Um, this You can get the whole translation of all five books in English easily. Just Google Irenaeus plus English, and you'll bring up several different websites that have the full English translation. Okay, so what you're doing here is, is simply in the English. So if people wanted to go look this up, yep. they can for themselves. Okay, so five point against heresies 5.5.1. 5. 5. Yep. For Enoch, when he pleased God, was translated in the same body in which he did please him, thus pointing out by anticipation the translation of the just. Elijah, too, when he was caught up in the substance of his natural form, thus exhibiting in prophecy the assumption of those who are spiritual and that nothing stood in their way of their body being translated and caught up. And then I put a little ellipses in there because I skipped the section. And then we have, wherefore also the elders who were disciples of the apostles. So he's talking about people like Polycarp and Clement. Yep. 
uh, tell us that those who were translated were translated to that place, for paradise had been prepared for righteous men such as have the Spirit, in which Paul also the apostle, when he was caught up, heard words that are unspeakable as regard us in our present condition, and that they shall and that there shall they who have been translated remain until the consummation of all things. So what he's talking about, you have the initial anticipation of a few individuals like Enoch that went to heaven, and they're going to wait there until the very end. Mm -hmm. But the translation of the just also is coming, and they're going to go to heaven. This is John 14, 1 through 3. Mm -hmm. They're going to go to heaven, and they're going to wait there with the just until the end. He's making a distinction mm -hmm. between the rapture and the second coming. Um, another one, and this is the common one that if people know about any pre-trib passages in Irenaeus, this is the one they know, which is 5.29.1. Therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said there shall be tribulation such as has not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which, when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. And so we see here there's a removal of the church suddenly, and then once that removal has taken place, then there's going to be a great tribulation, mm -hmm. which is the last contest of the righteous. Uh, makes uh, if you're if you start with the assumption there's only one second coming there's only one coming there's one gathering of the believers you're going to see here that you want the church to be in the tribulation you understand there's a distinction and you understand that Irenaeus makes a distinction and now you're going to have the church going up and then you're going to have more saints in the tribulation yeah so that that's that's the important thing is to see here that there is a second group of saints of believers from every tribe tongue nation right revelation 7 you see you see people getting saved during the tribulation period post rapture lots yeah and so we, we one of the things that's interesting too is when you compare matthew 16 that the gates of hell shall not prevail or, or against the church but yet in revelation 13 7 you have that the antichrist is given authority to prevail over the over the saints, that's right. over the over the people at that time, and so that's uh, one of the big dispensational dist distinctives to say. And Daniel eight says the same thing that you have that the believers being annihilated during the tribulation period, which is so different than what you have in in the other passage of scripture about us not being destined to wrath, appointed to wrath, we're delivered from the wrath to come. Um, and that we're going to go be with Jesus, you know, we're going to skip the whole hour of trial, Revelation three ten. So that's very important to see that there here he he's clearly mentioning this second group of righteous, of elect, of that's believers, right. of saints, however you want to phrase it. Yeah, you know, we have a same kind of tension going on here between the rapture and the second coming that the uh, the apostles, when they were first uh, dealing with the Lord Jesus at his first coming, and the Old Testament prophets had the same thing. Uh, how do you reconcile the uh, the reigning Messiah passages with the suffering Messiah passages? And so all the way up until the time of the cross, Lord, at this time, are you going to bring the kingdom? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of confusion. And and I think God, God in his brilliance, um, puts, you know, Jose says it, a little bit here, a little bit there, precept upon precept, you know, in order to hide in plain sight his plan, uh, it's there when we look in hindsight, we go, oh, look at that. It was obvious. Yep. And God said, yeah, now in hindsight, when you we, he brings it together by historical uh, reference. I think there's some of that we'll see, uh, most people will see as we come uh, at the second coming. And we'll look back and go, yeah, I was there the whole time. and uh, But w we see through a glass darkly. Well, we got one more rapture passage here. Perhaps we should go through that one. Let's do it. This is in Heresies 531.2. For as the Lord went away in the midst of the shadow of death, where the souls of the dead were, yet afterwards arose in the body, and after the resurrection was taken up, it is manifest that the souls of the disciples also, 
upon whose account the Lord underwent these things, shall go away into the invisible place allotted to them by God, and there remain until the resurrection, awaiting that event, then receiving their bodies and rising in their entirety. That is, bodily, just as the Lord arose, they shall come thus into the presence of God. So here the pattern with the, the resurrection of the Lord was to rise from the dead and ascend to glory, mm -hmm. and we see the same pattern is going to happen in the resurrection with the church. And if, if you compare this with the other rapture passages, he's here talking he's on the John 14 track. Mm -hmm. We're going we're gonna to ascend, rise, uh, ascend from the grave in, in resurrection and then rise to heaven and in, in we're going to await there. Yeah. All right, let's keep, let's keep rocking here. All right. Well, so when we put this together now, we, we've, we touched on earlier, we touched on that the Irenaeus saw two redemption programs. And we looked at here, now there's a pre-tribulation rapture. So if you have a rapture where people are delivered uh, prior to a time of tribulation, and you've got distinct programs, you've got the spiritual seed, which is the, the Gentile saints of this age, and you have the, the physical seed, which is the, the Lord returning to the nation of Israel and gathering them. Now we're looking at something that's clearly dispensational. And then we have, uh, there's passages which we looked at, and we can uh, take another return back to them, but there are saints in the tribulation that are Jewish saints. And that passage we looked at earlier, 525.4, where the holy people, uh, who are the ones, that are the saints that are put to flight, who offer a pure sacrifice to God. And then it goes on to mention that the context from Daniel 9, 24 through 27 mm -hmm. with the temple. So I think it's very interesting. You've got the distinction between the two classes of redeemed saints. You've got a, a, a rapture before the tribulation. You've got saints in the tribulation. And you've got passages in Irenaeus that qualify that these are Jews in the tribulation. So I don't see how you can escape the conclusion that Irenaeus was pre-tribulation. Mm -hmm. The only way you can avoid that is to ignore all the qualifying passages and just do a proof text passage mm -hmm. where you say, here, we see the church in the tribulation. And, you know, again, I, I think that I don't want to uh, put on any of the church father the modern, the very specific modern nuanced label right right a pre-trib like i mean again you could go go to dallas you could get all the pre-trib you want in the sense you get a degree in historical theology and you could have this fine-tuned you know all, all the modern systemization of pre-tributational or dispensational doctrine um you're not saying that he would pass the test right that Irenaeus would pass, but at the nugget level, at the yeah. seed level, at the at the basics, or, or even at the foundational level, clearly he is. That's exactly yeah. right. Yep, yep. He has the core precepts that make a person dispensational versus uh, a replacement theology. Yeah, yeah. But certainly, his dispensationalism falls. It, well, it's not modern developed yeah, dispensationalism. Yeah. But again, the, the, that's why I think at the beginning I really wanted to say, hey, at the core level, this is what you have: this distinction between Israel, the literal hermeneutic, and everything's done for the glory of God. And that that if you make the distinction between uh, at least the first two for sure, if you take a literal hermeneutic and the distinction, you'll end up. You have to end up as as a as a pre-trib person because you'll recognize the purpose of the seventieth week of Daniel. Absolutely, it's I mean, a deal with Israel mm -hmm. and and give the people the physical seed of Jacob a second chance to embrace the new covenant yep. in Christ's blood because Israel cannot receive her promises, her land, her temple, her throne promises, kingdom promises can't inherit any of them apart from the new covenant. The old covenant can only condemn; it cannot yep. save. Yep, absolutely. I mean. People Book of Hebrews. All right, let's keep moving. Well, I think with this, we have um, actually gone through all the material here as far as presenting the preacher passages, okay. presenting the distinction between Israel and the church.